Leute wisst Bescheid, silicon.com oder alternativ 149.2.1.7.134. Und wir ziehen uns heute mal wieder was von der Linux Conf rein. <lacht> von der Linux Conf AU 2017 aus Australien. Ähm, ne? AU in Australien. Ähm, Link zum Video ist natürlich immer in der Beschreibung. Äh, ist ein Video von 2017, hat momentan 700 Aufrufe. Ähm, von wem ist der Vortrag? Von Bradley M. Kuhn, Karen M. Sandler, ähm, mit dem Titel A Practical Guide to Compliance with the GNU GPL. Let's get started. About GPL. So. Naja, und das ist hier ein äh, öffentlicher Minecraft-Server ohne Regeln, Vanilla, Anarchie, wisst Bescheid. So we have a okay. few administrative items. Uh, we prepared to go all the way through, um, but do folks want a break? Uh, there is a break with the other sessions because this is a double session because it's a tutorial. We can do a break or not. It's really more up to the audience than it is to us. So, so raise you your hand if you would like a break. Meint ihr, die sehen meine Hand, wenn ich mich jetzt melde? Okay. <laughs> And then the, the most were abstentions. Uh, <laughs> so um, for those who want to break, are you comfortable with us saying we have no problem if you wander out and wander back in, or are you worried about missing content? Is wandering out and wandering back in at your leisure okay? Okay. So those who want to break, take your break when you feel like it. When you hear the noise in the hallway from the break, feel free to wander out. We'll keep going and come back uh, yeah, as fine. you want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, our goal here is to try and gauge some sense from you all um, and I already see there are people in the audience who know, go ahead. So yeah, just to hang on a second, my name is Karen, Karen yeah. Sandler. Uh, we know who you are. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and this is Bradley Kuhn. Uh, I am executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, and Bradley is president and distinguished technologist. One of the core activities of the Software Freedom Conservancy, um, although uh, by no means the uh, majority of what we do is uh, is working in GPL compliance. We represent, uh, we have 40 member projects that are a part of our umbrella nonprofit, um, and uh, we represent some of some them as right well here. as some uh, uh, Linux kernel copy uh, copyright holders um, who would like their license enforced. So one of the things that we do is, uh, is we talk to companies about their And uh, the uh, president is more procedural than anything else. Karen is in fact for, uh, for to avoid any confusion. My boss, uh, so I report to Karen. Um, so uh, keep the fire me, but I don't make sure. Um, I am an at-will employee, although I am allowed to keep my own copyrights on my software, which all of you should do as well in your jobs. Um, Karen, would you like to say publicly for the record, since we haven't signed the paperwork, that I am indeed allowed to keep my own copyrights yeah, on free software? Yes, on, on several right. occasions publicly that you prodded me to do so. Right. But, uh, but I'm happy to keep your well, copyrights, and I encourage uh, people, when they negotiate their agreements with their employers, to, um, to ask for the same. And we're working on a separate project called Contract Patch to help people do that to provide the tools. So a lot of people here um, are familiar with various different GPL things, and uh, there are certainly people I would expect that are new to copyleft and copyright licensing and GPL and its compliance and enforcement, and there are experts in the audience too currently. Um, so I really want this to be valuable to all of you. I think Karen does as well, and I don't think anyone who doesn't know very much should be embarrassed in the audience. Uh, I am a fan of popular culture. Uh, and uh, I am reminded of this thing in uh, the Harry Potter novels and movies where, uh, uh, to avoid spoiler alerts, uh, Harry decides to teach his fellow students something, things that his, that teacher's not doing very well at, and he says to them, every great wizard started out as you are now, a student, as we are now, a student. And I certainly didn't, I, I checked with my mother, my first words were not complete and corresponding source code. Um, they were more juice, so I don't think that I was born knowing about copyleft. <laughs> um, so uh, there's no embarrassment to not know these things. I think more so. There's so much to learn always and to think about, and most of the experts in the 
skills, go back and revisit these questions over and over again, um, and, and study them anew consistently. I think people who are in that position are not an easy audience. But, uh, but to get calibrate us a little bit, uh, does anyone here need a basic explanation of what copy left is? So now we do, in fact, have a confidence monitor. Um, <laughs> so, um, so we'll get more into the details of copyleft. But the f before we get fully started, I want to let everybody know, especially if you've gone to my talks before and you know I'm a stickler for hold questions till the end. This is not a talk; it's a tutorial. Uh, I used to teach uh, high, uh, high school, and while you know I, I will try very hard not to treat you like my high school students, which will be easy because none of you showed up uh, under the influence of marijuana today, uh, like happened in my high school class quite often. Uh, I will not confuse you with my high school students. Uh, Kara and I both also taught lawyers. Uh, how many? Uh, can we ask how many people in the room are lawyers? If you're willing to admit it, R Richard Fontana, whom I know is a member of the Massachusetts, a member of the uh, New York bar, did not raise his hand. <laughs> um, so there's two lawyers in the room for those watching on. Sorry. Um, well, actually, we're going to get into that. Uh, that, that in fact, being uh, being a little bit of uh, uh, both a computer geek and a t uh, either, uh, I tend to say we'll see this later in the slides that you should be uh, a, a kind of a, to really get copy left and GPL and how it works. You should be a professional in either computing or the law, and an amateur in the other. Um, that's really the best option. It, you, you don't actually need to be a professional in both, but it helps to be a professional in at least one of those two. Uh, enthusiasm takes you a long way if you're not a professional in either one. Because there True. are people who are uh, born who still have a lot of meaningful content. Yeah, I, I think anybody who's got a patch merged upstream is a professional developer, so I think the bar is, is lower and than becoming people, a lawyer. <laughs> there are people who are, uh, who are experts in licensing who have never had a patch. Oh, really? Yeah, but they're, are they, and they're not uh, professional lawyers either? No, they're not professional lawyers. Oh, okay. Lawyers. Uh, so we'll go off slides. Just put your hand up when you have a question or you want to make a comment, and, and we'll. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, enough I think we're going to run the mic enough. to them, so you will get a mic. To, Karen's mic will be taken from her and delivered to you. We did try to get a third mic, but we will be stealing one apparently from another room, which would be very rude. So we didn't do that. Um, so there's a textbook that actually goes with the tutorial. Have you all, have you all read the chapter of the text we assigned last class? Yeah, but this is the okay, deficiency so, um, yes, there's a 125 page book. Uh, it's a Gar sense, uh, I, I'm being a little unfair to it, but it is uh, material pulled from lots and lots of different places. Uh, lots of sources, of basically Irish anything Star, that yeah. was freely licensed that helped explain what copyleft was, and in some cases was generally what free software is and why free software is, uh, has been merged into it. Uh, it's not a perfect merger, so that you'll see, if you read it now, it, it, actually if, you're, if you want to contribute and you're just a good copy editor. It needs that more than anything because things yes. are a different voice. The, the guide is at copyleft.org, and it is itself under copyleft. And uh, content there definitely more than welcome to be grown. Um, I think the basic content is very sound, but uh, it's a very big work, and it, it, uh, it, it needs a little bit of love in some areas, and so it's something that we can help contribute to. Uh, but it's a pretty in-depth study of a lot of the issues that we're going to cover today. So um, it's, a, it's a good resource. Right, and I wanted to add this last point here that uh, that we don't mind if it, you know if you tune, especially since we're going to go over some basic stuff and the Oops. experts in the room. Um, if you want to pull it up while we're talking, uh, the uh, conference organizers have a wonderful network here, uh, and it's you know text is fast to download, uh, so you should be able to download the PDF or look at the HTML and, and feel free to peruse through it while we're talking. And if you hit something in that text that you that sort of sparks a question and you want to put your hand up and just switch to that topic, uh, I think we're happy to do that. Yeah, we're happy to just take questions.
So we're going to go over some both simple and complex things. Uh, uh, I've, we, both Karen and I have done long, different formats of tutorials uh, about the GPL and so forth. And, and in my experience, uh, I, I, I used to long ago teach a full day course, and I always felt that the full day was the only way to really get a full grip on copyleft, and that was just when GPLv2 was around. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's diff difficult to do it. To, to really get a full grasp in two hours. So we chose, uh, we actually went back and forth to the organizers uh, and sort of talked about how to narrow it. And we've narrowed it a little bit more to the compliance uh, side of GPL because that's what people tend to ask a lot about and get excited about. Uh, but, uh, but we're going to try to give as much key highlights as we can as what you would get in a longer course. Uh, and, uh, and as we said, we can go in depth in different areas as the interest of all of you goes. So the first thing we're going to start with is discuss uh, kind of the motivations of GPL and why it exists. And, and I think this, even those, for those of you that are experts, uh, this material might be worth discussing maybe even a little more interactively uh, because I think a lot of times people lose track uh, of why GPL does what it does. I do find that as well, Karen, that people sort of forget that it's not just about some set of rules. The rules were there for a reason. Yeah, and uh, obviously I'm flipping ahead now to the yeah, well, yeah, we've got that in a later slide, so. Uh, but I, I think that uh, that sort of talking about the origins of CompuLabs and, and, uh, and why people have chosen the GPL as a license are, are critical, but I find that here, not to give another shout out to LTA, but here at a conference like this, I think people are a little bit closer in touch with the, the principles of free software and CompuLabs. Yep, um, and uh, we're, we're going to then pretty quickly turn to talk mostly about compliance. We'll probably spend most of the time we have on compliance issues, and if at that point you haven't interrupted to ask questions, which you should feel free to put your hand up and do, uh, we have a bunch of sort of real-world examples at the end uh, that we're going to go over, which is based on questions we may jump ahead to at some point. And exclusive content. <laughs> well, new content. Never so. seen before elsewhere. Uh, does that make it exclusive? Well, it is at this moment. You know, it's not available anywhere else because we never published it. That's true. I yeah, suppose. exactly. Sounds like um, Okay. Um, so... Um, um, so the reason the, uh, I, so I titled this slide why you why you should listen to us like why should you take our word for these things, um, which I think is a is a good question that you should all ask yourselves and we'll hopefully answer it. Yeah, we're we're in the trenches every day. We not every day, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but because we are um, we are asked to enforce the license on behalf of uh, of contributors who ask us to, uh, we see this stuff every day. Also, we've been involved in this field for quite some time. Yeah, yeah, and so and so uh, we have experience doing license drafting in the copyleft world. Uh, we, as part of compliance efforts, often end up being de facto interpreters of the license, at least for the member projects of Conservancy, uh, such as Samba, Inkscape, uh, Mercurial, and so forth, and uh, and for those Linux copyright holders who have associated with us. And we do enforcement. That's that's something yeah. that I used to be a little. Uh, we, we 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 talk about as compliance, but enforcement is important. I think. Rules and laws should be enforced. I, I don't want a world where no one ever gets in trouble when they violate important rules that we as a society decided should exist. Yes, and it's actually uh, heads of open source and general counsels or, or attorneys in house at companies that thank us often for our work quietly, even at companies who are who do not find enforcement to be that popular because it helps them explain the importance of uh, having a budget for compliance. Otherwise, mm -hmm. there's sort of a I have a laser pointer. I can just point at Richard now. Look, you can do that. So, have you or have ever not dealt with a compliance issue in your job? I guess you can't say because you would defund. Okay, yeah. So, so we're, oh, we didn't send you a mic. We were asking Richard Fontana. Um, yeah, and he says he doesn't conceptualize his work as compliance. Yeah, so, so we, we often teach uh, tutorials like this to those folks, which is what this point about someday we may be across the table from you. Uh, because uh, some companies do 
from time to time fail to comply with the GPL, and if it's a project that Conservancy is affiliated with, uh, we would be the people that you talk to when that happens. Our goal in doing okay. a tutorial is to make sure that's not so scary. Yep, and we want you to know exactly what we do and why and how to handle compliance. So uh, I, I always include a discussion when I teach tutorials like this, as I think you do as well, Karen, uh, about why G GPL exists. In fact, if you look at our tutorial text, uh, if you read that later, you'll see there's a large front matter about why software freedom, why does the GPL exist, why does software freedom matter. Uh, and the reason is is because I think too often people think of the GPL or copyleft generally as an end unto itself, as if copyleft is a principle of its own. Copyleft is not a principle. It's not something to believe in in the way you might believe, for example, in software freedom. The copyleft is a tool. It is a strategy to maximize the four freedoms for people. I've seen the four freedoms on so many slides of this conference. I'm not going to go through them because I think you may have already been to at least two talks that did that. And uh, advocates are passionate about the idea of freedom. And I, I encourage you, if you, uh, um, so how many people have read the GPL all the way through at some point? Which GPL? Uh, any GPL. Let's just start there. Yeah. So about uh, about three quarters of the room have read the GPL all the way through. So if you've never read it before, you can do this uh, with uh, completely fresh eyes. But if you have read the GPL before, I'd encourage you to read through it again. With this in mind, that each clause is designed rather carefully to make sure that it works to defend the software freedom of users. And that's a way you can help yourself understand the GPL in the context in which it's written. And some of the language, particularly in GPL 3, is a compromise language with uh, what is the best, what is the best language to promote software freedom. Right, and I think it's important to remember that, that from the earliest days, the theory behind copyleft versus non-copyleft was primarily on a spectrum of assuring software freedom versus gaining adoption and popularity of the software. Uh, and I think it's simplistic if you say it's it, that copyleft just cares about software freedom and doesn't care about adoption and vice versa. In fact, many different copyleft licenses have been drafted, including ones by the FSF themselves, uh, different copyleft licenses, different exceptions, to make sure that for any given code base, that trade-off is done just right. Karen and I, we spent, uh, how long do we spend on the GCC runtime library exceptions? Quite a long time. Uh, drafting an months. exception specifically designed for GCC to make sure that GCC was making that trade-off. So GCC is an example of a program that is not under just GPL v3 or later. It is under GPL v3 or later plus this runtime library exception, which implements some details of a trade-off between adoption versus software free. So um, Karen, do you, do you want to go a little more depth on this part? Because you were talking about this before. This is just talking about how GPL is a copyright license. I have a migraine, so reading. I know. Oh, it's the copy. GPL. Oh, G so GPL. Talk about GPL as a copyright license. I will. Okay, I will. Well, I think, I, I think we actually covered this. That, uh, yeah. that uh, copyright is sort of um, to not to be uh, too much of a, 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 an advocate in this particular characterization, but copyright uh, grants a monopolistic right over uh, over over a, a, a work. Uh, copyright, or I, I don't. Raise your hand if you want me to go through the spiel on basic copyright. Great. Okay. Hooray. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I think I basically covered yeah. uh, copyleft. Okay. And you also. Yeah. Right. And so, and the other yeah. point I want to make on this before we move on is that copyleft is, is basically a generalized concept. Uh, it, it, there are many different copyleft licenses from many different organizations. Uh, and the GPL is one specific implementation of a copyleft license, to put it in more kind of uh, computer computer terms. It's, it's an implementation of an algorithm. Yes, and there's a family of GPL licenses right. that and are implemented multiple, slightly differently. Yeah. And those are all different implementations of different types of copylefts trying to go to that strategy. And the way that it does that under copyright is it makes the permissions you get under copyleft are conditional on some requirements. So you all, since you weren't raising your hands about copyright, you all already understand Hopefully, and raise your hand if you don't, that copyright is restrictive. It takes away permissions to copy and modify and distribute software in pretty much every regime around the world because of the Berne Convention. And copyleft comes along and says, well, we're going to turn back on your permission to do almost everything, but make it conditional on certain requirements. And I, I, the, reason, the way I understood this the best when I was really studying this was if you go through the text of either GPL and look for the phrase provided that, 
it appears quite a bit. It, it's constantly saying, you can do this provided that you do this other thing. So if you meet these conditions, we give you a very broad license to do all sorts of things you would like to do, as long as you meet these, in fact, relatively minimal additional requirements. Yeah, uh, I think it's wrong to think of those as restrictions. I think they're, uh, they're more qualifications on the permissions. And I always like to, Karen's not a huge fan of the slide, but, um, but I, uh, because I'm a crazy free software radical type, uh, I always compare it to what proprietary. I'm a crazy free software radical type. <laughs> You're not crazy. I'm, I'm crazy. not crazy. You're not crazy. I'm crazy. Uh, so um, so I, if you can line a, a, a copy of GPL up against a proprietary license that you might get from, say, you know, Oracle database or something like that, of course the GPL has requirements, but the activities that GPL permits are completely prohibited under proprietary licenses. You may never copy, modify, or redistribute any proprietary software. You're forbidden from doing so. There's huge penalties if you do any of those activities. Um, and the thing is, is the GPL's requirements are so minimal, uh, it's sort of like, well, if, if, if you find them so abhorrent, you can use proprietary software. I think it's going to be more restrictive to you. Um, and it does, however, make it simpler. Because if you say, am I allowed to do this? Because get we get the question all the time. Am I allowed to do insert question here, with the GPL or with the GPL software? Um, the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no, or yes, provided that more commonly. With proprietary software, the answer is almost always no. So you just know you're not allowed to do anything. And your life will be simpler. Uh, you won't get the advantage of GPL software, but if you want a simple life uh, using only proprietary software, it is available to you. Uh, I, would, I amended this slide to also add this uh, uh, to the last point, which yeah. you have to it is? Oh, okay, great. Uh, which, is that, which, is that, which is that there are many really uh, uh, powerful business reasons to be using CopyLeft, that it's not uh, putting it as a dichotomy, um, it's a little bit of a false dichotomy, uh, but, uh, but there are, we could do a whole day on why it's good for industry to use CopyLeft, um, and uh, I don't want to just make you think that this is not at the, the forefront of uh, of, of this analysis. Yeah, and, and uh, I see too many speakers uh, fall, fall into a false dichotomy, a dichotomy for a, as a, as a uh, kind of a, to make their talk more punchy. I, I don't actually think there is a dichotomy, like this strict dichotomy against proprietary and GPL software, or even proprietary and free software. There is nuance and complexity. Uh, the reason that I make these points like this in this somewhat aggressive way, I admit, is because um, after decades of being told how restrictive the GPL is, I'm, I'm just amazed because a pr proprietary licenses are so much more restrictive, and I don't hear people going up to every Oracle person they meet and saying, your licenses are too restrictive, yet <laughs> I get that almost at every conference except for this one, as it turns out, because everybody around here seems to be very friendly to copyleft. I would not do that to someone because I know what it feels like to be told your licensing. But I, I, I'm, I'm glad it doesn't happen to that person from Oracle who is here. Um, I hope it happens to no one. Um, so I think, I think one of the toughest places, this, and, and this is more for those who are more knowledgeable about the law than about software, um, th there's a lot of technical expertise that you need to have to understand how to meet the requirements of the GPL. And as I was saying before, I don't think you have to be a professional on either side necessarily, but it's, I think this whole thing about being a professional on one and an amateur on the other is... Yeah, I would say that something magical happens when you have people who are really focused on the, um, on the technical side partner up with people who are more focused on the legal side. There are some individuals where that merges themselves, but where you have uh, engineers and companies partnering up with lawyers and having an exchange, you often have uh, what we've seen is uh, really... Uh, really interesting and productive analysis of these licenses and in-house uh, a lot of really um, uh, great adapting to the use of free software within business and seeing the true maximum potential of using free software. And if you are, uh, I think looking at the audience, I know many of you, I know many of you are very technical, so, so these concepts are normal to you, but when you're explaining uh, copyleft to someone who might not understand technical concept, these three are the really key things that come up. Uh, what source code is, what binaries are, and what methods of distri distribution are most typical for software. Um, the GPL is different than, say, the Afero GPL, which we won't really be talking about today, because the requirements of GPL generally, 
more or less. There's some exceptions in some weird areas, but as a general rule, you can consider it triggers, and I have to do lots of stuff upon distribution. So understanding how software gets distribu distributed and when is really important. A great example of how this can get a little tricky is GPL JavaScript. JavaScript is usually distributed because when you go to a web page, one of the URLs is a .js file. That .js file gets hit with an HTTP request, and the JS file is copied onto your computer. You have received distribution of the JavaScript file. And people look at me strange when I say, most people install lots of proprietary software all day, every day, um, and they don't even know it. And they say, well, why is that? Well, because they're going to web pages that install proprietary JavaScript on your computer. So if that JavaScript is GPL, the requirements of GPL come into play when you put that JavaScript on your web, web, web page for people to request. So you look like you want to add something to that. So you want to, you want to go about modification term? I, uh, so, uh, right, I wanted to edit this slide to take out hook. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you edited them. I did, I did, I did. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so, well, so I guess you want me to say it then because, because you don't like it. So why don't you like calling it the, like the, the hook from copyleft coming in to make the GPL work? That's the way I've tended to explain it. Yeah, it really I mean, work. I think that what's special about uh, what's special about copyleft and the GPL in particular, since that's what we're talking about, is that uh, is that it, uh, it, going back to the to the freedoms, almost all of the freedoms you you uh, you uh, you get and are free to exercise uh, without uh, thinking too hard about it. You can run on your machine. You can distribute it. Um, and uh, but it's it's that once you start distributing that these uh, uh, that that the uh, provisos that we talked about before come to play. Right. So so, so typically, uh, and this is a, a difference with the Affair GPL. The, by the way, the Affair GPL is section 13. Its key hook is on modify, and things start happening when you modify Affair GPL software. But with GPL software, generally the modifications you make privately on your own computer is, is, is actually been considered in copyleft an important thing to protect uh, most of the time. Um, the trade-off was made in a fair GPL for other reasons. Uh, but uh, usually everyone considers yes, the goal of GPL was to allow people right, on their own computer to make private computer. modifications. The idea of, of mandatory upstreaming um, yes, has generally yes. been considered antithetical to software freedom. But, you should upstream, of course, that's a good thing to do, but you shouldn't be required just because you've now made one change uh, on your own computer to Linux that you must immediately offer that as a patch on Linux, uh, 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 Linux kernel mailing list. Um, so the major requirements of copyleft, or I'm sorry, at least GPL, tend to kick in when you distribute that modified version, or even distribute an unmodified version, but an unmodified version is just giving somebody a copy of all the source code, so uh, that's usually pretty easy to meet any of the requirements. Yeah, go ahead. Um, actually, can we, first mic run. Were you referencing a different version of GPL? Oh, oh you're talking about when I said, mentioned the Afero GPL? Yes, so uh, I'll briefly explain that there have been various different uh, modified GPLs. The most famous one is the lesser GPL, the LGPL. Um, and that's been around for a very long time. And there's a version 2 and 2.1 and uh, version 3 of that. Uh, the Affero GPL is yet another kind of license in that family of GPL licenses, which is very similar to GPL v3 uh, with an a added component to require that network service freedom uh, be adhered to, i.e. if someone uses your network service, they get the source code. It's a, a very complex topic, and so we're not going to cover it in detail today, but I, the only reason I drew it out uh, during this slide is to point out that it, it, it differ, it's one that differs here. So most of the stuff on this slide is true of GPL and LGPL, but not as true about a fair GPL. And then there are two versions of the GPL that are, uh, that are, uh, are the widely used licenses. There's uh, the second version and the third version. Um, and uh, the second version was written in the 90s, and the... Barely. Barely. 1991, yeah. Yeah, but 91. And, uh, uh, and the third version was written in, in the mid-2000, 2005, 2006, right? Uh, Final publication was September 2007, right? Yeah, I knew he would know that. I knew Montana would know that date. Uh, oh, yeah, June, 2007 for people not in the room. Oh, uh, a fair GPL was November 2007. Right. Uh, and uh, did we, uh, or later? Um, no, let's not get into that. Okay. Yet. Um, Great. So, uh, 
so it often turns out because modifying software is a technical activity, and even distribution has technical details about how it gets distributed, like I talked about in the example of JavaScript, we end up talking a lot about technological details with regard uh, to GPL. So, so what, what GPL requires um, is, very, uh, is very detailed in requirements that generally engineers need to get involved to understand. Software developers have to be involved. And uh, I think some of the earliest GPL compliance efforts are. Es ist nicht gut, dass ich zwei Sand im Inventar habe. Und Lawyers could come tell the engineers what to do. And it's more of a collaborative. Yeah, ich eigentlich mehr brauche. Yeah, and we find that uh, consistently with our enforcement work is that uh, if the company kind of like uh, oh, fuck. shuts down the legal, uh, it takes ah. a little longer to discuss, but when the lawyers bring in um, engineering right away or have been successful at. Uh, getting engineering involved from the get-go, uh, we have a much faster, more productive conversation. I'm going to move I this try. Uh, because I want to uh, go through the slide uh, and, and look a little bit at some of the requirements of GPL. I actually look at the GPL's text. Um, so this is the key place in GPL version 2 uh, that talks about permission to modify the software. Um, and again, it's Always good to read the GPL in terms of why is it putting these requirements in there, what software freedom principles are being uh, focused on, being uh, upheld. Um, I, I left, I almost don't leave GPL v2 section 2a on the slide because um, uh, it's, a, it's a very confusing thing and that's a good place to remember as Karen pointed out, it was written in 1991 and so it, 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 uh, it has a kind of pre-internet feel to it. <laughs> Um, but, and we can talk more about that if people have questions. Uh, but section 2B in GPLv2, um, yeah, people have called this the central copy less clause. clause. I think it, in fact, didn't you write that, Richard, in one of the, um, in one of the uh, uh, rationale documents for GPLv3? Das I think, halt auch, uh, don't don't you don't want me calling out on that. Yeah, well, uh, that's why I wanted to ask about the factual matter, because he was actually so the person on the, for the recording, the person on the mic is Richard Fontana, who helped draft uh, GPLv3. Yeah, it's, it's not it's not very important uh, historically, but it was uh, Evan Moglin who, uh, to my knowledge, first referred to 2B as the copy lock clause. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think the whole thing is a copy left. But the reason people have a tendency to say that, I, I don't know if it's, it's fully accurate, but the reason people focus on this and tend to say that is because it's the spot where it requires that your modifications uh, be ah, licensed is under the same license as GPL. So when you make changes to a GPL program, the way that copyleft ends up fundam fundamentally working is by requiring as part of your copyright permissions to be allowed to modify it at all. Leute, what geht denn hier also ab? license your modified changes, which are under your copyright or your company's copyright if, if you assign copyright to that, under the same license. Yeah, go ahead. Sharpness 3. Was kann das Schwert eigentlich? If I'm not mistaken, I think you said if you change it, but it's if you distribute it, right? Well, okay, here, here's an interesting, that's a very good question. Um, so, technically speaking, if you modify the software, you have to license your copyrighted changes under the GPL. But if you never distribute them, you don't have to grant that GPL license to anybody else. Does that make sense? Karen, is there anything you want to add to that? I said that kind of tersely. You should, yeah, I can tell by your face you don't like the way I'm saying that. No, no, I just, uh, I'm, I'm not sure when I, uh, did okay. that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you don't want to get any more depth about well, it. Well, I, I guess that what I was going to say is that one of the most common questions that we get about this is sort of like where, what are these, um, how does this unpack um, in terms of analysis? And one of the things that we can't underscore enough is that, uh, is that many of the concepts, especially uh, the derivative work provision is uh, kicks back to copyright law itself. So, um, you know, what it means to have oh my so schlecht mit dem work with the program and analyzing a lot of this language would be, if it were in a court of law, would be analyzed with respect to copyright law. Um, and some of the, <laughs> the basic concepts, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, we're, we're finding out now um, how, how the license could be interpreted. Yeah, um, so a couple of pieces that I want to point out here um, is, is do, you want, do you want to like the, I always like to point out this add no charge thing and explain that to people. Do you want to get that carrying or do you do that? Uh, I can't see your... Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so the, uh, the, the this has been a constantly confusing thing for people. The the, the clause at no charge appearing there, appearing there, and, and I've yeah, been over the years gotten so many questions about. Um, well, that means that I can't charge for GPL software. Uh, and uh, I, I think I think that uh, you know, this text does not appear in GPLv3, and I think it's in part because the, of that confusion. But the, the the thing that's not being charged for is the license. You can't charge for the license. You can charge for the act of distributing. In fact, later in GPLv2, it even says you may charge for the act of distributing. But yeah, people Leute. look at this in isolation okay. and think they're confused. Um, the whole is important. Saying the whole, that's related to making sure the ah, entire uh, work, uh, including your changes, your modifications, are licensed. Um, and license has to extend to all third parties. And that's important because remember how the distribution chain of free software tends to work. If you have a, a copy of the GPL program, you probably didn't get it from the original licensor. In fact, if it's a multi-copyright work like Linux, where lots and lots of people have contributed whole copyrights on it, you might get it from uh, a, a, a distribution, which got it from those copyright holders. And there might be somebody in between there uh, that, that integrated that distribution. So the license has to pass all the way down uh, to everyone. Yeah, we have another question. If you're the original creator of the product and you licensed it as GPL, and then you decided, I want to close source it, does, does the license itself prevent you from then not being able to, does it, and are you enforcing the license? Do you have to enforce the license upon yourself? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, the question makes sense. Yeah, get the mic back to Karen. Otherwise, I'll never answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so if you're the copy, if you're the, the sole copyright holder, um, you can license your work under any terms that you want going forward. Once you've licensed the work, you've licensed it. So that licensing, that or that, you know, presumably wherever you distributed it, that uh, that licensing will still be good. But you can also license it under other terms. And if you make Modifications. If you're the sole copyright holder, then um, then you can uh, make those changes with that uh, with your modifications under a different license. And those modifications that you have made may never have been under um, the GPL. So 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 if, if that's what you're asking, and this is one of the reasons why it's advantageous from a community perspective and also from a uh, a cooperative corporation's perspective to have more diversely held copyrights, so that. Uh, so that it prevents against companies who uh, who, uh, who had the best intentions potentially at the beginning uh, of their their product work, but either got acquired or had a change in management, or uh, merely uh, you know had a, a, a slight change in strategy. Um, you know, it sort of protects that uh, that in, you know industry wide collaboration. And the only thing I'd add to that, the reason I was when you were asking, I was clicking through the forward to, to the slides. I wanted to see if I had this particular text from GPL on a slide. I do not because it doesn't come up at so much in compliance issues. Uh, but the GPL license itself is irrevocable. So once you grant a GPL license to somebody by distributing a copy to them, they still continue in perpetuity to have permission to copy, distribute, and modify the software under GPL. Um, it doesn't speak to future versions. If all the copyright holders, as Karen said, were to decide to switch to a proprietary license, never release another GPL version, that old GPL version would stand alone. Um, this, has happened, this happens frequently. The first software that comes to mind is there's a software called, um, I think it's called OpenSTV. It's an open voting software. It was GPL for many, many years, and the original author decided he wanted to sell it as a proprietary product and has not, will now not offer any licenses from his copyrights uh, under GPL anymore, but people have now forked the GPL version and continue to approve yeah. it. You have many, there are many active projects where, uh, where our community has taken an older version and moved forward on it, and it, it may mean that, uh, that the two versions can never reconcile, but the original version that was received, duly received, can continue under the GPL, even if there's a version that is not. Yeah, and not, and not a year has gone by since the late 90s when I don't see someone, something online about someone trying to revoke the GPL and said, going after people to try to get them to delete versions. And yeah. I'll often get emails from people saying, do I have to delete my version? I tell them, no, you do not. Wait, wait for them to sue you, and if they sue you, call me. Uh, and they never do because they're wrong. Um, and somebody finally tells them they're wrong. Yes, now from a, 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 a corporate perspective, I think one of the things that, uh, that Martin Fink, the point that Martin Fink made in his uh, in a keynote a year and a half ago already, um, was that uh, that for companies to know that they can collaborate together safely, the GPL is a really good tool for that. Um, there's a lot of initiative to have permissive licensing in this um, 
in these circumstances, but what happens is you have to impose a lot of governance, and, uh, which is expensive, um, and rules that are imposed in, an, in another way in order to make sure that companies participate in the way that they expect on a level playing field, whereas with, uh, with copyleft like the GPL, it's built into the license. And so this is the equivalent text in GPL v3. Um, I don't want to get too deep into this, um, other than put up there and show you. There's uh, the place where I mentioned it doesn't say the add no charge thing there anymore because of its uh, historical confusion and people not understanding what it meant. Um, and it has it has slightly different requirements, but they're they're general in the same spirit. Um, I, most of what you'll find in GPL v3 is clarifications and um, better understanding of what GPL v2. Uh, actually said in a more terse way, uh, which is why GPLV3, I think, is so long, because it, it's it basically, I, I think, uh, Richard Stallman put together a list of all the questions people had asked him about little phrases in V2, and then wrote another sentence on to expand on the two words. So it gets bigger pretty quickly. And what Bradley was alluding to earlier is that uh, the GPLV3 process was a public drafting process, and uh, there's artifacts that you can look at to see how that drafting process went, including rationale documents that discuss some of the provisions, and you can see how the provisions changed uh, to some extent over the drafting process, which is uh, interesting and I find informative. So this is uh, so the end of GPLV2 section two, um, which I, I think is important to, to have, have looked at. Um, one of the, the complex concepts here uh, that I think is important to point out um, is this, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, combined works and derivative works and so forth uh, in, in sort of the, the real world terms. Uh, but as a conceptual matter, I think the confusion people have often is the question of, of what's a separate work and what isn't, and if it was a separate work and then I combined it with the GPL work. And, th and this paragraph is really important with regard to that, and it, it, it's worthy for further study. Uh, but the basic idea is, and uh, I'll sort of do it on the whiteboard, that there's, so, so if you have this work, you know, this work, we GPL work G right over here, right? And you may be over here writing your other work, uh, you know, your work, um, you know, N over here that is yours and you've been writing it for years and years and years, uh, right? And so, so you sort of say, well, that's my work. Uh, I can license any way you want. Absolutely. You could go out and be licensing this work to the world under any non-GPL license all you want. What GPL is trying to talk about, I'm going to put, I've got two uh, What GPL is trying to talk about is when you take this work, combine it with this work, and make a new work which I would call it G plus N, right? GPL is trying to talk about what the licensing of that work is. It doesn't really care what licensing options are available for work N over here. Uh, it acknowledges the fact that works solely under your copyright and you have no uh, obligations to the world to license it under anything other than what's permitted by copyright law. Um, but G is under the GPL. So if you want to create G plus N, which is your choice, you can choose not to. But if you create the combined work of the two things, GPL had things to say about what the licensing terms of G plus N had to be. So your options are you can follow those terms or you can not create and contribute that work. Is there any questions on that? Because th this is a thing, yeah, I knew the answer going to go up for this one. Uh, so, does this depend somewhat on how that G plus N, I mean obviously it does, but how that G plus N works, like if that happens in, let's use a random example of like WordPress and a WordPress theme, and N may be a theme that was originally applied to some yeah, other, say proprietary CMS, and then you make this theme now works with WordPress and you distribute this theme, they only, they only ever will be used together but they are also kind of separate entities and they only come into contact in runtime. They're not compiled together or anything like that. How then does the GPL affect that theme? Karen, do you want to? I was going to, well, we would like for the microphone to come back to you. <laughs> we, we have a very kind mic runner who's doing so. Go ahead. Well, so one thing I was going to say that might clarify this is that if you have, so, so you can continue to maintain N, right? Where there's no combination or um, or okay. new work, and you can continue G plus N, and as long as you maintain N, N can continue. Just because you created a derivative work of the of the two together, doesn't mean that you can't go can't no. continue N without any uh, you know. 
Yeah. Right, and so and so, uh, I, I think another right. point I want to make, and, and I'm going to be very careful. Not to, I promise I won't shine in your eye. Oh, I almost did. Okay, uh, so I'll go back for a second. Um, so in this G plus N thing here, right? That that's uh, I, when I'm doing this example, I'm sort of assuming that you've made the determination that G plus N is a combined work. I'm done. Is a combined work of um, of uh, of. Oh yeah, yeah die werden right. wahrscheinlich so, ein bisschen yeah, kaputt gehen, eventuell, oh, aber ja. Wenn ich hier runterschieße, könnten die Kisten kaputt gehen. So it's not the GPL that dictates that analysis. It's in fact copyright law. And see, I, I see the hands up. I'm gonna, we're, we're, I'm gonna just ask everyone to put their hands up again in a second. We'll, we'll go move on to new questions. But I, mean, I think that, uh, I've taught, that, taught a tutorial like this one for years and years, and we usually freeze at this point because at this point everybody says, "But I need to know the answer to what a combined work is to know if I can do anything." Um, well, I, I get that. I, I used to be much more, uh, much more of a curmudgeon. I'm pretty curmudgeonly now, so you can imagine what I used to be like. Um, but I, I just sort of be like, well, that's your problem. You go figure it out. Um, these days, I kind of understand why people are so frustrated because CopyLeft's goal was to take copyright as far as it can go to defend software freedom. Um, I, I've attributed this to both Jeremy Allison and Michael Meeks. Uh, they were the first two people I heard say this, so I think one of them invented this, but they call it the judo move on proprietary software because it takes this powerful tool that proprietary software used to restrict you, copyright, and turns its force on itself. Apparently in judo, that's one of the biggest things you learn as a martial artist, how to take the attacker's energy and push it back against them. And that's what GPL is trying to do. And, and to do that, if, if it's what's called, a, we call it a strong copyleft. That phrasing is not uh, perfect. But the idea behind a strong copyleft, which GPL intends to be, is to stretch that judo move as far as it can under copyright. But that means on the edges, when people start disagreeing about what is or is not a com combination, when they look at G plus N and say, is that really a combination? Or the other people, sometimes people would argue, well, all you did is take uh, G down here and put G, and N happens to be on the same CD as G, and they're just sitting on the hard drive next to each other, but otherwise no combination has been made. There are situations that exist like that. In fact, um, oops, sorry, I'm going forward, I'm going to go back. Um, that, that's actually discussed in here about separate and independent works, right? So GPL contemplates that copyright law is going to sometimes say things are separate and independent works and sometimes it's going to say they're a derivative work. But its goal is to say whatever copyright law tells us is the answer, uh, is how we're going to go. Now, what's happened over the years is people have, who have been copyright holders on copyright works, and you mentioned WordPress in your question, uh, have had opinions, and WordPress has a very strong opinion about what they believe. I actually tend to agree with WordPress's conclusions on, the, on this. I've read all their stuff, uh, and about about this issue anyway. Um, and they've come to conclusions that certain types of, of plugins and, and, and templates and themes and so forth are combined works, uh, and therefore the, the G, GPL of WordPress, the WordPress being on the GPL, there's the G, your theme is the N, and G plus N is a thing that has to be licensed under GPL. There are people in the WordPress community who aggressively disagree with this, uh, and it is, a, it is a debate. And this is one of the largest debates in free software policy that exists. Okay. Is there anything to add to that, Karen, before we take another question? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, as, a, as a US copyright lawyer, I have been surprised at how maximalist my country can be on copyright. And I have been further surprised at how that maximalism has been exported to other countries. Um, and so as a US copyright lawyer, it's hard for me to look at some of these questions and hear the analysis that some of the in-house corporate attorneys make to make it sound like the, uh, the, the, what would be considered a derivative work uh, is, uh, is, is, is so much narrower than I imagine it would be looking at the, the case law as it has in the United States. And I, I admittedly have very mixed feelings as, uh, as someone who, who believes in, in the sharing of works when copyright maximalism happens. But as Bradley said earlier, um, it, you know, it's, it's as, as the copyright maximalists have further traction, that means that also copy left, um, that analysis has to be interpreted in the same way. So 
looking at what WordPress has said or looking at what any other um, steward of code has said about their license is useful and interesting, um, but in some ways it must be taken with a grain of salt as you imagine what, uh, what copyright law says and how it can be interpreted in that context. And, and what a judge is going to say. Uh, and I've, uh, so, so um, and men are going to ask for hands again, but the, uh, I've actually talked at length with Richard Solomon about his intent with regard to this, and, and he always intended that it would, stra it would go as far as it could, and that was part of the, the, his design of the idea of copyleft, was to basically, as copyright law gets worse, because none of us in the copyleft world really like how copyright operates, and then the, the ex you know, continuing uh, extensions we get in the U.S. and all those sorts of things, but... Stallman saw that early uh, and said, well, that's so bad that we've got to make sure we use every little bad thing it does against itself by making sure every bad thing the copyright law does, we use to defend software freedom. That's, Which is why copy left is such a great yeah. name for it. So um, exactly this, is a, this is a complex area, so I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely glad to pause here. Can we have the hands up again of people who are waiting to ask stuff? Um, just the one? Okay. My specific question relates to uh, the recent decision uh, Google and Oracle, which held that uh, Google was, obviously a jury found that Google was making fair use of Java APIs for their Android operating system. Now, taking that to its logical extent, let's say I'm producing a software package under a non-GPL license, but I include GPL licensed APIs. What is there to stop me from arguing that, well, I need to. I need those APIs in order to make fair use. Uh, I can. I can use those AP APIs on the fair use because I'm using them to make an interoperable product. What's to stop me from arguing that? Ergo, I don't need to license under a re, re license the work under a GPL license. I am going to coyly answer it and okay, say you could ahead. argue that, but you might be wrong. <laughs> you might be. Uh, and that it, that is tricky. I would say it's not. Uh, I, uh, if I were in house at a company, I would make me very nervous. Uh, and I would say that because it is generally easier to follow the terms of the you know the GPL and to release your code more often than companies, uh, rather more often than in house counsel are initially willing to evaluate that. So, I don't know, that was quite a coy answer. Yeah, I, 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 um, I don't want to get too deep into this issue because it's, it's not a compliance issue. We did promise compliance, which we should get to We're about halfway through. Um, so uh, I wanted to uh, just point out, I wrote a couple of blog posts about this, and one of the key points that I made in this blog post, which you might find interesting to read, is that um, the way this was reported in the media as of being a question of, are APIs copyrightable? Um, the, the disconnect between what developers think of when they say API and what the court meant when they were using a similar phrases, which they really don't use the phrase API very much, um, is very wide. And I think uh, also between developers, when they say API, uh, they, they mean very different things. And so I, I sort of, in one of my blog posts, like laid out the different things we might mean with API and what the decision means with regard to that. So I, I'd encourage you to read that. I don't want to get into too much depth for that because we're, we're now halfway through. Right? Der Kuchen ist wahrscheinlich auch am Arsch. Um, so is there any more questions on sort of this combined work thing that you really have for burning? Um, I'm happy to take them, but I think people might be. Yeah, sure, go ahead. In the particular example that was mentioned of WordPress and templates, would not, if you can go back to that slide that talked about it, would not that section apply where it says, do do not apply to these sections when you distribute them as separate works. If they are not from the same website and therefore se distributed separately, wouldn't that then not apply and, not, and make it Quality not a work? Uh, I, I have to admit, I don't know enough uh, offhand about the technical ways that WordPress is distributed. Um, to be able to answer, and uh, I, 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 I mean, I, I wonder how many people, how many people in the room want this to be a discussion about WordPress's compliance? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to, because we're, because we're, we're about halfway through and we haven't gotten into in depth about compliance stuff. We could talk, we could be happily spend the rest of the time talking about WordPress compliance. We can pull up their statement on it. We could get into technical details, but, um, uh, but I don't know if we want to do that. Does, does anybody really want to do that? Okay. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, I think we should probably move on. Um, so, are you okay? Um, yeah, I can't really see. Okay, so, um, uh, so I want to move on to the discussion of stuff about binaries. 
So, um, it's like a... binary, ob binary or object code, as it's called in GPLv3, is really just a form of modifying the world, right? And it's, it's a pr but it's a process that you can do that causes the work to be obscured. And this has been the biggest issue in free software to some extent, because when you can give people only binaries, or, and I conclude with binaries the way GPLv3 talks about it, things like minified JavaScript or otherwise um, source code that's not really source code because it's been completely uh, you know, run through various processes. Um, it, it is a way that companies have kept people from being able to copy, share, and modify, and distribute their works. So um, when you think of doing a binary, you think of, well, it's actually modification is the best way to go from my point of view. And um, I'm going to quickly go just to show the text of GPLv2 that talks about binaries um, and has permissions that allow you to create binaries, but then has requirements on how you can do it. So you have that the choices so? of how, when you distribute a binary, to make sure hey, that you can get source code. This goes back to my stuff about provided that, right? This is one of those provided that make sure you made change. sure the source code is available to users you may distribute binary works. It's not that GPL doesn't want you to give people binary. Okay, I must kurz mal wieder nachschauen, wie es Teil aussieht. Immer derselbe Spaß. What's that? Ja, doch versetzt, ne? Also, dann haben wir hier, dann haben wir das Teil hier und dann haben wir hier den. Und das ist natürlich erstmal ein bisschen hier rum rumgraben. Oder? Nö. Warte mal. So. Dann muss ich hier wieder hingraben. Und... Ja. das schon klappen. Ja, hoffen wir mal. Weiter geht's bei 55 Minuten und 17 Sekunden. Binaries are useful, you don't have to compile yourself, that saves time and CPU and so forth. So you should be allowed to give binary forms, but you must give them the complete corresponding source. And we're probably going to talk a lot uh, for the rest of the tutorial about complete corresponding source. That is really a central component from my point of view of where compliance matters, uh, and it's a technical area. Um, GPLv3, by the way, calls that corresponding source, and it's a defined term. Uh, it's, uh, it's more verbose. Uh, I think, generally speaking, they're roughly the same. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the debate of where how corresponding source in V2 differs versus V3. It's a topic for another talk. Um, but here's the definition if you want to take a look at it. And I encourage you to read both licenses and read the rationale documents, which, uh, which Montana wrote large parts of. In fact, much of the text in the tutorial about GPLv3 is merged in from the rationale documents. Hmm. So the question is, now that we're, uh, I did this right at the, right at the, like this the, item the, the really oh, just a little past the halfway point. We get to the question of what Whatever. is a GPL violation? Um, and I feel like ja, und hier ist eher schon alles durchgegraben. Was ist eigentlich mit diesem Looting Zweischwert los? Das droppt ja gar nichts. Das ist eigentlich mit diesem Looting Zweischwert los. Das droppt ja gar nichts. 
Uh, effectively, this means a license that can uh, sort of resolve to GPL, like ultimately be GPL, uh, if you uh, if you uh, uh, put them uh, put them together, and the license as a whole can be GPL. Things like the ISC license and other types of very permissive licenses, you're allowed to put that into GPL works because you can ultimately license the whole thing under GPL because the ISC license allows you to relicense your work under lots of different licenses, including proprietary ones as well as GPL. But most importantly, you have to give this thing called complete corresponding source, or what GPLv3 just calls corresponding source. And I tend to focus on that as the center because that is, first of all, the most important yeah, this thing. Yeah, so flop, what I here mache, Leute. And also, it is the most thing of interest to folks who are technical. They want to be able to rebuild the software. That's the whole point, right? Is there anything to add to that, Karen? Uh, no, just that uh, when we uh, often when we do compliance, it starts out as no source or offer, but very quickly it gets into incomplete source. Yeah, so this is sort of the most important part of our right. analysis. And the reason that there's any enforcement at all is because of what's called termination. The licenses terminate upon violation. So if you fail to give the complete corresponding source license under GPL and or GPL compatible licenses, you no longer have permission to do this. It's thing an automatic termination. Like right. it, it just immediately happens and you don't have any permission. Uh, and uh, under, uh, under GPL v2, that permission needs to be restored. There's no uh, built-in way to have that permission restored. You uh, had the you had your license terminated, and uh, you must uh, you must in engage in, in in some process to get that restoration, which I think is actually a a, a, a flaw with v2 that was corrected or improved upon in GPL v3. GPL v3 has uh, oh, you, yeah. Am I, is that on the next? Yeah, yeah. So, Whatever. so um, just to, to finish <laughs> explaining the, 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 so, so what termination is talking about is this license here um, is uh, it, it, your permission to do that to have downstream from your G plus N, um, or in fact from your G if you want to distribute G by itself, that goes away too. Now, if you have this other separate independent work, uh, you can still be distributing that, but you no longer have permission to distribute the, anything that's uh, was co was licensed to you under the GPL copyrights. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty strict, uh, right? It's it's where it's where one of these things where copyright law is so aggressive. It's it's uh, it causes GPL to be aggressive on this point. Um, but the thing is, is that the policy goal is not necessarily to make people's lives scary that their license is going to terminate. When you hear corporate lawyers spread a fight about the GPL, they're thinking about, oh, this termination thing is so horrible and scary. Um, but in the real world, when you implement it, your goal is to solve the technical problem so that they can have their rights restored and be able to do it. We want people to be able to modify and rebuild the software. So our goal, anytime we're enforcing GPL, is to get to the point where people can modify and rebuild the software. And so we've had uh, reports in the past, so we, we've confirmed a violation, and knowing that a product is in violation still never uh, never took procedures to, for example, pull products from the shelves um, that were in stores or anything like that, or to shut down um, sales of existing work, although you could under the license potentially. Um, and having community enforcers like Conservancy um, and there are others as well, is a, is a good way of making sure that there's sort of a, a check on the system which still allows business to, to continue. So uh, one of the reasons why GPL enforcement has become so much more difficult in the last uh, last 10 years or so has been because of the advent of embedded systems that contain GPL software. Uh, in the old days, uh, checking the, the complete corresponding source was correct, was easier. Um, providing it was easier because they were mostly on some Unix-like system or GPL ported to Windows, but it was built on self-hosting systems and so forth. Uh, and now it's much more complicated. And Geht das jetzt weiter hier mit uh, Protection 3 oder was? Fact of the matter though is the GPL Geht hier irgendwo ein Buch oder ist hier... Was ist denn hier los? And so when we do enforcement, we talk about whether this complete corresponding source, complete corresponding source mm. meets the requirements of GPL. Mm. And the thing is, is that if you're if you're doing stuff in the right kind of engineering way, you're probably going to be really close to being able to comply easily. If you're using version control, um, you tag releases, you make sure your build system works, 
you don't have some one person who works for you who knows how to make the build and nobody else does. That's a really bad engineering kind of thing. So if you avoid those engineering mistakes, well, then you have compliance because your build process is documented. Your source code is tagged to the release. You put the source code together and you release it and you know how to build it and you can tell the downstream how to do that. Uh, yeah, question. So just a, a quick question on the build process here. Um, if you're using build tools, which are uh, proprietary um, uh, and, and potentially have restrictions on distribution, um, which, which you don't control, um, how, uh, yes, how does that work? Yeah, I'm, I'm jumping ahead because we, we do have a, um, actually, why don't I, why don't I just, um, we, we talk about that in a few minutes. I, I just want to do a couple other things, but we actually... I'm, I'm happy to wait. Yeah, 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 I, I realize we, I'm, just, I'm speaking, it's a few slides ahead. So, um, actually, I'm probably going to, um, I'm actually going to skip some of this part, because I'm going to get yeah. to the later stuff. So, um, yeah, you can look at the slides later. This is, this is a little too basic for this graphic. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's enough. Uh, so, yeah, here we go. Um, so the, the real goal with build scripts is to make sure that someone skilled in the art can build it. And it's certainly true that at times you have proprietary tools, uh, and there is, I, I really, okay, I'm, I'm just not gonna try to find a slide with it. We're gonna hit a slide later, and say so that's the slide that I was trying to get to. Um, but the, 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 the basic idea behind the scripts used to the control compilation installation, which is what GPLv2 says, is to make sure that you're giving whatever the mechanisms are th that you, you know to know how to build it. It was never, from my view, G and I've checked this with Stallman's intent in drafting it, the GPL required to give you a third party thing that you also used. So a great, the easiest example to explain this is when you have a GPL program on Windows, and you use Visual Studio to build it. I'm quite sure the GPL never intended that you would have to provide Visual Studio because it would be sort of a nonsensical answer because you wouldn't be permitted to license Visual Studio under GPL and ship it downstream because Microsoft wouldn't allow that. Um, the software itself is not Visual Studio. The software itself is whatever you compiled with Visual Studio. So usually what we've generally said, and this is on the slide later that we'll fly by and I'll tell you, is to, is to explain what tools you used. Uh, and how to get them on the open market. So if you say I use Visual Studio version at version foo, well, I, if I want to be able to rebuild, I might have to go buy Visual Studio version foo. Um, so it, it depends. It, 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 the question, the question is if the tools not on the market. It, it depends. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly we had GPL answer. violators who have attempted to say that their, their build scripts were proprietary. And we've said no, because GPL says the scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable. Right, build scripts versus build scripts. Yeah. yeah. And, and the question is, what's a tool versus a script, I think? Yep. Um, um, my view of this is basically that, that, that uh, you, you'll have a difficult time saying that something that is, uh, you're, you're basically, if you, if, you, if you write some tool specifically designed to build this thing, as a way of getting a competitive advantage to get around the GPL, which I've seen done, that's a pretty dicey area to be in. Um, if it were a tool, uh, uh, you know, a great example is, is this, uh, the, the, there's compilers out there that uh, are so expensive, they're not, they're on the open market, but they're not, right? Um, uh, it's an interesting question. I don't think that just because the compiler costs a million dollars uh, means that you, uh, you have to include it. And this really matters, right? Again. Like this really matters for the, uh, because it can frustrate the underlying aims of the GPL of, of using CopyLeft at all. For example, uh, many people are relying now on CopyLeft for security reasons and being unable to uh, to build the software means that you don't have the advantages of CopyLeft and you can't possibly fix a problem when it's there. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a theoretical thing. On the other hand, if the tools are available, it generally they would be in this particular situation. We could imagine all yeah. kinds of extreme situations, but if it's, a, it's, it's available and it can be reproduced by a third party, uh, that's what really matters. So, yeah, yeah. so I don't want to, that make it easier, yeah. uh, don't, don't want to belabor it, but um, so in the, in the embedded market, um, a lot of tools aren't 
Uh, they're not commercially available like Visual Studio. And a lot of the tools that are available come with um, additional uh, restrictions on them, um, which are... Um, so basically, every every chip that you buy, um, they'll ship their own compiler um, with uh, uh, a set of libraries attached to that. Um, but the compiler will have conditions like you're only allowed to use this compiler on our chips. Um, or you, you have to sign an NDA to let us you use the compiler. Um, things, things like that. And they won't distribute it openly. They'll only distribute it... Must I just check it again? Ja, eben nicht so. Sondern so. Und dann siehe das Teil dran. Das ist hier ein T dran. Und hier ist das Ding dran. Okay. A pre-existing agreement and an NDA and an agreement to, you know, buy a lot of chips. And Bay Bay has some expertise in this area and yeah, I see his hand up, so you know. I can let him answer you. <laughs> using their own chips if that's the case. <laughs> Qu quite honestly, uh, that was indeed the uh, the norm uh, 10 years ago and, and beyond. Uh, there are certainly chips today that are still in that situation. Um, if you buy <laughs> some of them, yes. Um, but um, certainly if you're in the embedded, uh, if you're using chips that are in the embedded Linux class, uh, that's basically gone. Uh, if you're going to MCUs and DSPs and so on and so forth, yes, you're still in that world, uh, but you're not using open source on those platforms at that point as a result. Uh, now, there are smaller, um, uh, more open uh, options, RTOSs and so on and so forth you can use there, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there are chips that you can get that uh, don't have that problem, and certainly uh, all of my friends that uh, are uh, engineers and embedded and and copyleft supporters and so on and so forth, uh, they choose not to use the chip that you're talking about. And usually the, the, the cost difference is, is minimal. And I, I mean, to give, uh, to, to, to give an answer of, of what you're sort of asking, what would ha you're sort of asking what would happen if I compiled the GPL to solve that and I faced an enforcement action and we got into a disagreement about this, right? I mean, that, and, that's, and that's the kind of things that are happening. I mean, we, we haven't mentioned the, the VMware lawsuit that we're in. I mean, but that is an example. It's not an example Christoph like yours, Sarah, the Christoph's in, that, that we, I mean, we as a community. Um, uh, Christoph has filed a lawsuit in Germany uh, against VMware, which is currently uh, on appeal uh, with the German courts. And that lawsuit is about a, a situation, not this, not a situation in any way with details similar to the ones you're asking about, but a situation where a company said, the GPL doesn't require us to do this, and Christoph disagrees, and he's decided to go to court to get action. Many of these things that are very complicated, uh, where people are trying to test the edges of GPL, Ultimately, someday they will end up in court. It's it's kind of funny that my my uh, my talk here last year, which some of you may have seen, uh, became this thing that people are obsessed with because I made that rather uncontroversial statement. I think that eventually things will get tested in court because two people will have a dispute. Um, from my point of view, I'm glad Kristoff's out there doing it rather than two third parties fighting. We've had many suits over GPL where two third parties who are not interested in the community are fighting over GPL and will get case law decided yeah. about what happens with GPL. Yeah, that interpretation of the GPL will be collateral damage from a, yeah. two companies fighting it out for, you know, who gets the better, you know, who, who gets a little bit more money in the end. And having this community process where, uh, which we're, I guess we're going to get to. Yeah, yeah, I, I, right. I put this on, it's, it's a principle now, so go ahead. Oh, great. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, so at Conservancy, we follow uh, some stated principles of GPL enforcement. Uh, we publish these principles and uh, the F along with the FSF. Um, and uh, and what we did was we tried to codify the friendly ways in which we do enforcement, um, so that we can bring some safety and uh, and uh, an explanation uh, to the field. We are a public charity. So when we do enforcement, we're doing it for the, the public good in a public interest kind of way. We're not doing it to monetize. And so we wanted to put that in principles, in writing, so that companies that we approached for the first time who maybe hadn't, you know, really don't understand uh, free and open source software would, would see them straight away and would see what they were, you know, wh what they were interacting with and also provide a way to codify some of the things that have been accepted practice 
um, you know, in the field of GPL enforcement in a principled and community-driven way. So, uh, so we published those principles, and they've been very, very useful in sort of uh, I explaining that. And, and, um, and they talk uh, about various different things that, that we try, but the most important thing uh, is we try to get in touch with a company when they violate and try to communicate with them. Yeah, our, we, as we say in the principles, that a company that is a, a violator now is tomorrow's contributor, and to treat them as anything else is, is deeply problematic and not in the interests of free software in the long term. Mm -hmm. And the goal, of course, uh, when we're looking at a specific GPL enforcement action is to get that product into compliance. I, in my talk yesterday during one of the mini comps, uh, um, a few people were glad to hear this and, and had not thought about it this way. The GPL is a license for users. I think users are important. Um, I like when people have code upstream. I like when upstream developers are happy. Um, but I got in this because I was a computer user and I care what happens to me as a user and I don't think we should toss them aside. I think that users who have a device and want to become a developer, the only way they're gonna be able to do that is if they can hack the devices they have, right? I became a developer because while it was proprietary software, um, it, it, was, it, it was so editable, <laughs> uh, it was barely compiled, uh, written in, uh, written in uh, Motorola Assembly on my Commodore 64, I modified that software. Um, now, I was technically violating the license, and when I learned later what licenses were, I thought, this is great. I want permission to modify so that I can become a hacker on the device that I have in front of me. And so our goal in enforcement is getting these CCS candidates to work, to actually build. And this is really, when we talk about enforcement taking a long time... I think it's geil, that a lawyer the uh, term, uh, the word hacker, verwendet. Wahrscheinlich nicht in dem Sinne, in dem Cracker-Sinne, ähm, um irgendwas, äh, naja, sagen wir mal, irgendwas Bösartiges zu machen oder auch nicht mal in dem Sinne, das System so umzuschreiben, dass es etwas tut, wofür es eigentlich nicht designt ist, sondern eher in dem Hacker-Sinne von Hacking around und mit Source-Code spielen und Sachen erweitern und eigentlich im Sinne von Programmieren, glaube ich, hat er diesen Term gerade verwendet. Und ich finde, wenn man so im, im Recht unterwegs ist und da viele Leute sind, die halt echt nicht von, also nichts von dieser Bedeutung von, von Hacking wissen, dass es halt auch was, was Gutartiges sein kann. Ich finde es eigentlich interessant, dass er sowas nahezu Gefährliches verwendet. Weil wenn ihm das hier und da mal rausrutscht, dann <lacht> Naja, kann ich mir sicher denken, dass irgendwer in der weniger entspannt gegenübersteht. Wisst ihr, was ich meine? Deswegen finde ich es interessant, dass er diesen, diesen, äh, dieses Wort verwendet. Uh, people privately will tell me, I'll say, oh yeah, they're violating, we've been working with them for three years, four years, five years. Um, well, we also try to make contact in like the, the nicest of all possible yeah. ways and try, find, try, try to find the right person and to not escalate. But ultimately, lots of times we have to, uh, we have to, we wind up sending a letter to legal right. at a company because that's, yeah. that's the only way to get attention ultimately. And then we have to de-escalate in order to get the process rolling in order to, to actually have source candidates. Uh, go back and forth. And in the ideal world, we would tell somebody when we finally find that right contact, we would tell them, we're in violation, get us the right source code, and they would give it to us, but we don't live in an ideal world. I had a situation uh, where we did 22 rounds of reviewing source code release and sending them back problems and getting another one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the best, I have gotten uh, twice, I've gotten the first source code release was correct and in my view, completely compliant with the GPL, and the average is around eight. Um, I, I calculated that one. It's been a couple of years since I calculated that, but it's still probably right around there. I mean, uh, if you're here or if you're watching this tutorial, then I think that's sort of like the first step. So you know that if uh, if if we contact you, is that we're we're engaging in this process and that we are our goal is to give. A lot of times we have this process, and the companies don't really understand what our motivations are, and their goal is to uh, to delay us as much as possible to introduce all of this delay and. Uh, and keep us spinning our wheels, thinking that eventually we'll give up or we'll take we'll take a buyout. You know, the, they can pay us off. Uh, but uh, but when we we slowly and methodically go back and forth and evaluate each of the the source candidates until we finally get to the point where we're comfortable with that source candidate. So I think we're we're down about 10 or 15 minutes, right, uh, on the clock, roughly that, oh, somewhere around there. No, I think we've got a lot more time, right? Oh, we do have a lot more time. 
How much longer? Oh, 25. Oh. 25. Oh, that's great. I, I was getting my, my oh, well, I, you know what? I started my timer uh, when we were setting up the mic, and it ran. So, so, uh, so I, my timer is on. This is really wonderful, because um, uh, by speeding through, like I should, we now have a nice uh, big group of time for, what do you want to call it, Karen? What were you calling this? No, 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 no. I don't know why this was a Never before seen. So all of these slides up until now have been in other oh. Das musste genau jetzt passieren, oder? What the fuck? Well, Shit, you know, fuck, never, fuck game. Yeah. So Fucking Microsoft, you fix your game. Yes. Wie kann man so ein Bad Luck haben mit den Creepern die ganze Zeit? Wow, jetzt habe ich den nicht mehr vor... Ah, oh, mit Glück bekommen. Um, Looting, Piet. Ah, ich bin full rage. But these are the kinds of things we send. So we, we get one of these source candidates and we, and we try to build it like that. We're actually trying to get real compliance. We're actually trying to make sure that it, it, we, we have this mindset that if the person went on the open market, bought this device, got the source code candidate, would they be able to build and install the software from the source code they got? And the answer is usually no. And we don't want to just, uh, I mean, very early on, I'll admit this, way early on, we used to do this like, it doesn't work. Like we give a binary answer. Um, and we quickly realized uh, in the GPL enforcement world that that was counterproductive because the goal is, as Karen said, to get them to be contributors, just showing them how to do um, a, a something a, a akin to a reproducible build for their thing is not only going to make their engineering better, but it's going to make their GPL compliance better. The problem is, uh, and uh, Behan and I were talking about this at length the other day, about how these companies sometimes have a single build machine or they have... Uh, all sorts of horrible engineering practices such that they actually, and we, we just figured this out, they've never actually said this, I don't think anybody's ever actually said this, but it's very obvious they're reverse engineering their own software on the other side because they've lost yeah. source code. They, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so we they lost their expertise, the main yeah. person who worked on it is no longer an employee, the key team has gone elsewhere, the whole division is gone, yeah. So the first thing we find is we try to build it and there are no build instructions. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, no roadmap whatsoever on how to build the thing. So this is a, a, a text that we often... Um, and we're going to publish this, I think. Uh, we're going to add it to the copy left guide, right? Oh, oh, oh. Eventually. Oh, eventually, think, sorry. Okay, so uh, my boss has just committed me to adding this to the copy left guide. So. <laughs> oh, eventually, we'll, we'll be, we will be publishing this stuff because I realize that it will be really helpful for, um, for, for folks in-house uh, companies to sort of take a look at this and see if they can, uh, if, if what they're doing meets up with our expectations. So, uh, yeah, you're going to need me to go ahead and uh, work on Saturday to uh, merge these <laughs> changes. And well, and I, I have to really thank that. LCA be because great. I don't think it would ever, ever it hadn't occurred to us well, before. Get, that hey, I'm going back to the U.S. I get two Saturdays because I lost a Sunday on the way back. So I, I have two Saturdays to do this Rabbit, now. Rabbit, you're just so lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I get a Saturday on the plane and a Saturday on the ground in the U.S. Um, yeah, we have a question there. So when you do contact a company or you know um, someone um, who you want to bring into compliance, um, what is the sort of communication that you provide them with? What, how do you communicate your expectations? Through these reports? It, it, yeah, well, no, it varies widely depending on who it is and how we get in touch with them. If it's someone who's really active, ooh, and I'm caffeinated, I'm not allowed to have caffeine because of my heart condition, so I'm like, yes! <laughs> um, so if we are able to, um, to, to uh, find a contact, for example, if the company is one that is active in the free software space, so people are present at conferences, it's very easy for us to make contact. Uh, when we know that one-on-one, -on -one, it's usually a lot easier. And so then we can say, oh, you know that product, you've fallen out of compliance, let us, you know, let's have a discussion. And depending on the reaction that we have there, it can go quite smoothly sometimes uh, in those few instances that Bradley mentioned. Oh, two of them. Yeah. Two of them. Um, uh, you know, compliance was within two weeks in one instance, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so, uh, so, so in that, but in many other times, we try to make contact. First, we search, you know, like, is there a representative from these companies who has been a speaker at any conference we can identify, right? So if we get to the point where we can't find someone and we're sending a letter to legal, then the first conversation winds up legal contacting us and us having a conference call where it's like, you know, all hands with legal, you know, like where, where everybody's lawyered up and sometimes the companies we're talking to have internal and external legal on the call and sometimes no engineers. So it's a matter of like explaining, you know, we're, we're you know, and, and the principles have helped us a lot in this instance and the additional material we've published because we can now point to it and say, okay, so, so we're actually really friendly people and uh, we promise we're not 
copyright trolls or anything like that. We are interested in compliance. And eventually, uh, it sinks in. And we had a really hilarious call with one violator where um, legal just kept making us wait. And they were really late. And, uh, and their engineering staff was on the line um, waiting for legal to come for like 10 minutes. And so we're having conversations. I keep saying, don't say anything. I'm, you know, I'm a lawyer. I think Tony Sieber, our general counsel, was on the call. Don't say anything that is part of a negotiation. Your legal counsel is not here. Uh, we can talk about the weather. Um, and so they were like, what? You know, t we, we were just looking up conservancy. It seems really cool. And I was like, well, conservancy is. You know, we're a nonprofit, and we do this, da, 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 da. And, and they start looking into it, and they're like, yeah. Oh, we're out of compliance. <laughs> like, no, 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 don't say anything. But so it really, it really depends on you know who we contact and what, what that's like. So, uh, so, th th so this is kind of the example of what uh, often a first CCS report wouldn't have saying. Because they will give us um, uh, sometimes just the upstream uh, target DZ files. That's happened. Uh, you know, they'll just. In fact, there's been cases where they obviously got the list from us of software and then they searched online and went to our own project's website. So they like went to the BusyBox website and got the BusyBox source for that version and so forth. Because you know, yeah, the, the SHA-1 sums match you know, perfectly. I'm doing this only enough while well, you still use SHA-1 sums, but SHA-2 needs to go to match 2, as it turns out. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, so one of the things we do is we, we, we try to make guesses. Um, and we, the reason we do that is is if we just tell them it doesn't work, um, you know, you got the wrong thing, it, they're not going to know what they're supposed to get. So we, we actually try to build it and get into various different details. Um, this is another example of, of things we do. We, we, we kind of try to guide uh, them to something more reasonable uh, as far as how they put their source release together. Um, we really encourage them to put some sort of overarching readme and explain what's going on uh, as far as what they've given. Uh, and this is an important point about scripts. The, the GPL sa GPLv2 says, uh, you must include the scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable. Uh, a lot of times, developers read the word shell to be in that text, as, it, as if all the scripts are just the shell scripts. Um, it, it's English. It's not technical writing. It could mean any type of script. For example, if you've ever seen a play, there's a script for a play. And if the way that you have to build something is someone has to act out a bunch of parts. They have to type a bunch of things on the keyboard themselves and remember what Shakespeare to type. Shakespeare language. That is the Vista. script. So you're going to have to write down what the person has to do uh, to do that. It doesn't have to be a shell script. In fact, I've had just big, long readme's that say, do this, then do this, then you know, do some random thing. Um, you know, they usually start with, like, find Red Hat 7. Um, <laughs> Um, for, for many, many years, that was the standard thing people built on up until, like, the mid-2000s. Now, Red Hat 7, by the way, I think was end of life in 1997. Um, so, yeah. So, and we have to, but the thing is, we follow them, you know, to the letter, right? If they say, go find Red Hat 7, we actually have a bunch of, well, at one point, a couple of years ago, we found ISOs for the oldest distributions we could find. It's actually really hard. There's no good archive of those. We have some, if anybody ever wants to put an archive together. But, uh, but yeah, we went and found them because if somebody says you have to have Red Hat 7 installed, okay, that's part of the build instruction. It sort of goes somewhat to your question. If they say we have to find Red Hat 7 and we can't find Red Hat 7, that's too bad uh, you know, for us. Because if they say you have to have Red Hat 7 to make it build, we better be able to find it. Um, but we, we do really require those kinds. And we, we, we try to refer them to our guide. So this, is, um, uh, so this is a shortened URL that goes to the copyleft guide, the specific section of it. Um, so we try to give them examples of how we do this. Now, you get jaded being a GPL enforcer. Um, you start to see this over and over again, and you know how it's going to go. And you know, as I said before, that they probably don't even have their own sources and so forth. So you see things like this, and, you're, and it looks really suspicious. We really, actually, I don't write these reports anymore because I'm too jaded. Uh, my colleague, Denver Gingrich, does. He's a much uh, friendlier and nicer person than me. Um, so he tries to write them in kind of an exuberant, helpful way, uh, which uh, maybe I could earlier in my career do that, but uh, uh, I certainly can't now <laughs> um, because it's painful. But there's examples like this where this, this thing had Samba in it, and they said, oh, you know, the source release will include the source code for Samba. And then we requested that source release from the company, and they gave us sources that didn't have Samba in it. So now, why it's possible that was a mistake, but probably not. Yeah. Um, so um, there's this goofy thing that happens. Um, a colleague who works with his name, Brett Smith, actually wrote one of the first programs to um, unarchive archives of archives of archives of archives. Um, I, I think the longest, deepest I ever had to go with a CCS check was eight down. I opened eight TARDZ files inside each other. 
um, to yeah, finally find the actual source code. Uh, so this is CTF an example. Where, like, they gave us a RAR file, and inside the RAR file was two RAR files and a tar.gz file. <laughs> um, and it goes deeper. It goes deeper. Um, yeah. So we try to sort of explain to them, this looks a little weird. Uh, do you, is this really the way you want to do it? And a lot of these things I want to point out, like if this actually works, if we open all this stuff up and it builds, it's not like the GPL requires that you not put tar DZ files inside of tar files, inside of tar files, inside of CPIO file, inside of a RAR file, uh, as I've seen. Um, there's nothing in GPL that says you can't do that. But our goal is not just to make them just you know, doing the bare minimum. You know, because do you really want to just do the bare minimum? You could have you know, 50 pieces of plan. Um, so it's true that we often just get minimum compliance, uh, from my point of view. I mean, compliance is binary, really. You cross the line. But if you just sort of like walk right up and finally get past the line of the compliance, that's unfortunate. I, we want these companies to become upstream. Yeah. Developers. Also, you, yeah, you don't get the benefits of using yeah. a license if you do that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've had. I actually sat in a in a lecture at a conference where a a, a lawyer, uh, an independent lawyer, uh, was advising uh, people to like hide the the GP, the notice uh, somewhere and within the product so that people wouldn't see it. Uh, but it was still technically compliant. And that sort of, it, it not only frustrates sort of the intention of the license, but it also really starts to minimize the benefits. Oh, yeah. I, and I, by the way, I've seen the nesting doll version of offers, too. I've seen oh, yeah. you know, in, inside a Word file that refers to a text file that's in three directories down, and in a hidden directory there's a text file that then tells you to go to the website, and then the website has this weird URL that's not linked to for anywhere else that has the offer source. Um, so, so both things have happened. Which technically that's compliant, you know. If I have to chase a rabbit hole to find the source code, as long as I find it, uh, it's probably compliant. But is it the right thing to do? Uh, that's a different question. Um, we do actually—it's very technical. So, so we actually try to be a build engineer and do it. Uh, Denver is has expertise in building software for embedded devices, and that's why he does these CCS checks for us these days. Um, it's not as if you have to teach people how to build software. Uh, it's not that. We sh you, you can certainly assume, it's reasonable to assume people will know what to do with those scripts. Uh, my view has always been someone skilled in the art of building software for embedded systems should be able to build it. Uh, if, uh, if somebody gets lost and we ask questions, um, there have been times when they told us this is easy to figure out, you should better figure out, and we've said, okay, well, that's, that's fine. Uh, we'd like you to put it in the readme since we figure it out anyway, and it's helpful. But you're right, if we, if it, we were confused and is now figured out, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, um, we try really hard um, before we, we uh, you know, when we, we try to build it the first time. We, 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 Denver goes through a lot of contortions to try to get it to build. Yeah, and here's we don't want to waste We don't want to waste anybody's time. So everybody knows what's happening here, right? They used a cross-compiler that's not there. Um, but they didn't have to give us the cross-compiler now. There's nothing that says, as we were talking about before, they don't have to give us this compiler. Um, and we understand that, but we have to know the right type of compiler to use. Um, and so we have really focused, and this, this was the slide I was looking for when I was trying to answer you. Uh, so so it's, it's important that we know how to get the right tool chain, right? And I think something like this is pretty adequate. Rob Lamley told me yesterday this is not adequate. Um, so, uh, so, okay, I understand that. I'm just trying to give a flavor of the kind of thing we're looking for. We're not asking them to give us a copy of the tool chain. Because in fact, if the tool chain is GCC, they can do what's called a meta violation, which we've seen which is where an attempt to comply with the GPL, they gave us a big tool chain kit, which itself violated the GPL. Hmm. Right? And we don't want that to happen. We, we don't want them to end up in that scenario because when it happens, they get confused and think that we're tricking them. So, and I've had situations where, and we now write our reports this way and say, you do not need to give us this tool chain. Just tell us what tool chain it is. To, to be clear, you may give it to us, but you do not need to give it to us because people just say, well, we'll give them everything we got on our drives. And it's like, well, we've been given proprietary software that we've sent back and said, no, that is proprietary. It is not required under GPL, and we never want to see it again, thank you. Um, um, but it's, I, I think you want to make this as easy for users. Um, so we tend to guess at, at what compiler to use. Um, uh, Cross Tool NG is a great project. Uh, that's like one of the most important projects in GPL compliance work. Uh, because it's very easy. NG is uh, of the fun. Yeah, lots of different because they probably used one that was generated <laughs> at some point with either you know, cross tool NG or came from code sorcery is probably <laughs> two places where they're most common. So we try the ones we think it is. We think it might be, um, and then we try to explain what we tried so they understand. Like we, we went through a lot of work to try and find that out uh, and what uh, one to use. Um, 
Now, this is something that, that uh, in this case, Denver, who, who wrote this, figured this out, like what was going on. Uh, it's pretty obvious to anybody who, who, who's built software before that, that something's supposed to have an executable bit set that's not. Um, and now, in my point of view, the fact that this is so trivially easy to figure out, I don't think this is a GPL violation onto itself, right? If this were the only problem we had to report, I would report it as, well, it technically complies because we know exactly what to do. Um, and any, anybody who's used a Unix system can figure that out pretty quickly. Um, so we sort of say, you really should fix this, set the executable bit, but, uh, but it, it's something where if we figured it out, what we're trying to do is offer them patches to their own uh, build system in hopes that it will work in a more automated way. Um, so it's very common for installation instructions to be missing. Uh, people miss the fact that GPLv2 says those scripts used to control compilation and installation. Yeah, so, or they argue that installation doesn't mean installation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so it, it's required to be able to put the thing on the device, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's important. Um, and install matters, uh, because that's the whole point of software freedom, is the ability to modify the software and make use of your own modification and improvements for yourself and for others. Um, so. This is a, you know, this is, this is, and these are all very examples of from a very early round uh, CCS report. So this is a problem when it's really in a bad state. We're going to move on to a couple other examples there, um, other such things. This is a problem that comes up a lot, where um, they actually give you a bunch of source code that has kind of object code floating around in weird directories, and the build system is not actually building the source code. So. You, you run you run the build instructions they gave you, and then you know quickly it says we're done, <laughs> and and it's suspicious, right? Because it's like, well, what's happening here? Do I need to do a clean process? And did they give me all their object code already built? Is that why it was so fast? Or uh, what's the deal? And does it actually work if I do a make clean or that their equivalent and try to rebuild it? And is there stuff missing? Um, so in this example, there was stuff missing, right? So <coughs> there's this path that's there that's supposed to be there. And then we discover, um, wait a second, uh, we did the build process and we got Linux with absolutely not the co the doc any .ko files whatsoever. Now, uh, in the old, old days, I used to build a truly monolithic kernel with no loadable modules. Um, I don't think anybody actually does that anymore. Okay, so it could be the case. So here's a great example. So, so Vance, and embedded we sometimes do. So it could be the case that we're going to get an answer to this report. Uh, that says, well, actually, um, we built a model in the kernel. That's why you didn't see any .ko files. Um, that was not what was happening here, as it turned out. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if we got that answer, we would say, oh, just show us where the model of the kernel is, where you're good to go. You can build it's not against the GPL. Um, uh, here's another uh, another interesting example. Um, so this is, a, this is a fairly old one. Um, uh, the, the trickler example is, is from many years ago. Um, it became very obvious that uh, they, they had, this is a version number they had added themselves, um, and they gave us um, their, their own version number was 1800, and the version in the firmware was newer. <laughs> so in the firmware, we found these .so files, all of, all of which are LGPL, except uh, uh, Lipsy, I probably shouldn't know this, but these are all LGPL libraries. Um, and the version number doesn't match. Now, it could be the case that they have a script that when they build it at the very end, they change the version number on the binary so it doesn't match the version number in the source. Theoretically possible. Uh, I've never heard of any engineer ever doing that. Um, and I don't know why they would. So we figured they had given us actually the wrong source code. They gave us a, sor a source code for an older version uh, of the firmware. Possibly just accidentally. It wasn't accidentally. Um, <laughs> I, I know who this was. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> yeah, this, this, is, this is why Denver writes the CCS reports. Um, <laughs> too jaded. Um, so we've had situations where, and this is actually from the, the 22 round one, um, there was a period in the mid, uh, the mid teen rounds where we kept sending the same report over and over again because the same problems happened every time. It was as if they weren't reading the report. Um, and so this was a case where they had like two copies of the same library. Um, and my, my, my redacting makes it a little weird because I have this thing called that lib because, and your libs, because I didn't want to say what they were named because you might be able to figure out who it was if I did. 
Um, but we like, sort of had these two things, and then we're like, well, well Denver, man, he's great. He, he did this work where he was like, okay, well, let's find the wrong one, get rid of the wrong one, see if I can build the right one, and maybe the right one can be moved to where the wrong one was, maybe it'll all work. So he did a bunch of stuff, and, so, and he got a little a couple of things working. In fact, I think this little piece of, uh, we actually got added to their build script. They added his code to the build script so that it worked. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so then, we, then he finds up, and, oh, if I do that install, it installs, oops, sorry. So we do that install. It ends up in the right place. That's great. OK, it all works. So. Yeah, um, one of the frustrating things is that as we have these rounds, uh, we find more and more things as they provide the correct source yeah, code. But point, then they point. accuse us of moving the goalpost uh, because we've asked for a set of one thing the first time. And then in subsequent rounds, we ask for more things. But it's because we had no ability to know what questions we had to ask because we didn't provide the right thing. And so it's frustrating for in-house counsel, I think in particular, to understand the fact that sometimes as, it, as the source code is provided, as it should have been at the beginning, we'll discover things that we would have otherwise found if the source code had been uh, full as full as they had had it at the beginning. Yeah, and, and we actually, uh, Denver wrote this text, uh, which I don't have a slide, where he talks about, like, uh, I think it's because the end of the CCS reports, he writes that, that this, this is the best we could do with this current version. We expect we'll find more issues uh, once we can get further along the process and be able to raise other issues with you. Um, so. Uh, I want to end with a uh, discussion of, of the thing we find a lot, um, which is we start looking around in the source candidate, and we find that there is missing source code for lots of .ko files that are supposed to be there uh, under the GPLv2. Um, I, I run a lot of mod infos in the world, and, and look at what license column says, and, and Denver does it even more than I do now. Um, you know, and so we'll just tell them, hey, look, uh, these things, uh, and they'll do all sorts of things, like put them in weird places. And actually, uh, once once we did what well, this is actually not this example, but there was another example where we complained to them that they didn't have the source code for these .ko files, and explained that they're, uh, you know, they're the G plus N. Even if they wrote N, the .ko file by themselves, when they combined it with Linux and distributed the results, it was a single uh, combined work and it's licensed under GPL. And we said, well, you have to give us the source code for those. And then the next candidate. What they had done is they'd taken the .ko files and copied them to the source directory, edited the make file to have a target that said copy .ko file to the install directory, and told us they'd now provided the source code for the .ko files, because they were now in two places. They were in the source directory as binaries and copied over. Um, hmm. so yeah. For good. Yeah, that, we told them that that also did not comply with the GPL. <laughs> 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 uh, for the recording, the, someone in the Poor engineer said, that The had poor to engineer that. who was told that. So uh, this, is the, this is the last thing I have on the slide here. I'm not, I'm not sure where your time, and I don't know if we're allowed to go into the break. But um, one other thing we do a lot is we, we look at how the offer for source uh, is working, because that's an important part. Um, in this particular case, uh, the vendor would update the firmware over the air, which is a new distribution. It's a new copy being given. And in fact, it's the same one with the 1800 and the 2200. Um, over there, and so it's an example where you have to remake the offer for source and make sure that they have an offer for source for the firmware they're not running. And so we had asked them, we really wanted to see um, uh, how to do this, and we'd actually had a conference call with them, and we had decided how we would how the offer for source would be presented to the users, and, and we hadn't had a chance to review that. So. Yeah, and um, I can't underscore enough how uh, including the source with the distribution, if you could possibly can do it, will save you serious heartache later. We have two minutes left. Yeah. So this is an example of asking for, um, uh, for and oh, I left the date in, so you can tell this is. I, I deliberately changed the date to today. Oh, okay. Or to yesterday. No, I just, I just said it was recent, and so I made it worse. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so it's, um, uh, it's, it's. Oh, this no, this isn't recent actually. Oh, I know where it is. It is recent. From. No, it's totally recent. Oh, okay. I, actually, I changed it from last week to this week. <sighs> okay. So now you know this is recent. Uh, but you know for sure this is recent. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, so the reason I'm confused is because Denver reuses text because the same yeah. situations come up again and again. But uh, this is a case where we're asking for um, a firmware, a, a correct firmware which to compare. Um, uh, and this is not something that they, that, that they don't have to give us another copy of the firmware. We receive distribution by buying the product. Um, sometimes it's hard to extract the firmware image off the product. Um, the problem then becomes uh, we, we get more suspicious because now we see things like, oh, there's no .ko files. And then we don't really know, does the firmware really have a monolithic kernel in it, or does it not? We don't know. And so we, we often ask people to, to give us the firmware, which, after all, um, 
we need to test installation. Um, there have been times when installation meant reconstructing the firmware image. Um, and especially if you have crypto lockdown, which, uh, which sometimes happens with regard to, uh, to GPLv2 based stuff, uh, it's general consensus that you can crypto lock down the device, you might not be able to test the install directly onto the device without a crypto key. Now, we don't require that they give us the crypto key. GPLv2 does not require that. But we do want to be able to reconstruct the firmware image, uh, at least get that far. And even if we can't install that firmware image because of the crypto lockdown, that's a different issue. So we often ask for a firmware image to do comparison so that we can verify that it's in compliance. Um, and they sometimes resist, and we try to work around it. We, we, they don't have to give us more stuff that they weren't already required to give. It's the same thing with the tool chain issue. Yeah, um, we really do the best we can to, to make our requests reasonable and easy. OK, so, um, so are we allowed to take more questions? I know it's going to break. Do, can we be fuzzy with that, or do we have to get out of here? It's, Oh, for the lunch, for the break hour, yeah. Or break, it's like break 20 minutes. Go ahead and do your question, I guess. Is it possible for the original licensee or owner of the GPL license to transfer that to another person to continue on? Or do you have to become, do you have to then continue as a fork, so to speak, of that project? Like copyright, you can assign your copyright to somebody else. So, for example, if uh, if you assign your copyright to somebody else and you, in fact, hold the copyright for the entire project, then uh, then you can assign that to somebody else or you know, sell it. We could, you could do a, a number of things with it, and then uh, if 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 the new person becomes the entire copyright holder, they can then push it forward however that they, however they want. Uh, but if you've got a, a more commonly, if you have a, a multi-health copy, you know, GPL project, uh, then you won't be able to use anybody else's contributions, so you can just effectively use the standard GPL. Did you have a question too, or did you just, no? Um, so here's some contact information. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at the guide if you want to. Um, Karen and I are both here uh, for the rest of the conference, so we're around to take more questions in the hallway and so forth. We love geeking out about this stuff, so feel free to come over. Those of you on the recording, the, you know, the, the, hopefully you see the slide on the screen, you know how to contact us and see our website, sfconservancy.org. Uh, we hope you'll all become supporters. We are having a match right now, so if uh, if you donate now, your uh, donation will uh, count double. So please consider doing that. We take a loss on our compliance work. Uh, we ask for uh, for companies to reimburse our costs, um, and uh, and you know we, we do the best we can, but we won't take any payments until after uh, the company uh, after the, the there's the compliance has been achieved. So uh, so uh, it is definitely uh, a loss proposition for us. So. Uh, making sure that uh, that we have public donations is also really important and helps us make sure that we stay focused on our mission to be doing all of this in the public good. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Okay, that's well. <coughs> a practical guide to compliance with the GNU GPA from the Linux conference in Australia. Ein Vortrag von 2017. Link zum Vortrag ist wie immer in der Beschreibung, genauso wie die Adresse dieses Servers. Dann können wir natürlich noch am Ende der Folge, wird wohl eine neue Tradition fehlen, einen Creeper zu töten. Wo ist der denn hin? Ähm, ja, ist ein äh, Vanilla-Server ohne Regeln. Und äh, kommt doch einfach mal vorbei und schaut euch das Ganze hier an. <lacht> ich kann die IP-Adresse auch nochmal hier reinschreiben. Habe ich natürlich nicht schon mal geschrieben. Ähm, das ist die Adresse, unter der der Server momentan verfügbar ist. Im Falle einer Änderung wird es auf dem Kanal ein neues Video geben, das die neue IP-Adresse ankündigt. Aber das wird sich in den nächsten Jahren wahrscheinlich nicht ändern. Ähm, genau, würde ich sagen, sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge wieder. Tschüss.